These men are not body snatchers. They're worm watchers. Kevin Budd and Chris Lowe are experts in soil ecology. They often visit this cemetery in Preston, England to study the earthworms living amongst the dead. Worms account for over two thirds of all creatures that dwell underground and their impact on the ecosystem is huge. A good reason for the scientist to take a closer look. But first, they need to get the worms out of the ground. Kevin and Chris use a 12 volt car battery to generate an electric field. This pushes the worms to head towards the only way out, the surface. The ring defines uh, an area of 0.2 of a square meter and we base our findings on only animals that come up within the ring. Anything that comes up outside is, is not counted. The car battery is one technique. Nature has other strategies for coaxing worms out of their holes. Birds tapping their feet on the ground, it's thought mimics rainfall, and this brings the worms to the surface. Um, this, this particular method with the, the electricity going through the, the soil is a bit more extreme, and really they're trying to escape from something that's really quite painful to them. Here's one. This is uh, Lumbricus terrestris. This is the largest earthworm in Britain. This is a deep burrower and one that can go down to two, possibly three meters. I'll put it into the water to stop it being stressed. All the worms that emerge from within the circle are carefully collected. We then weigh the earthworm so we know its mass, we know how big it is, and we can relate each earthworm back to its particular burrow. The team makes cast of each worm burrow using synthetic resin. In a couple of days, once the material has dried, Kevin and Chris will be able to see just how extensive these worms' underground network actually is. It was Charles Darwin the 19th century most famous biologist who first recognized the humble worm's great importance to the environment. He became obsessed with earthworms, studied them by the thousands, and published a seminal work on their natural history. Within it, there are lots of things, some on earthworm intelligence, this, these days we dismiss, but other things, earthworm ecology, their actions on the soil, still regarded by many to be really, really important, can't be ignored. Darwin proved that though earthworms have no eyes, they are sensitive to light. That they cannot hear music, but can feel the vibrations made by a piano. He also theorized that worms play a key role in regenerating and displacing soil. To study this, he thought of a simple experiment. He placed a millstone down on a patch of earth in his garden. Then he waited and waited for the worms to make the stone disappear. Darwin thought, given time, the worms were capable of shifting huge quantities of earth. He realized that when a worm digs a burrow, it actually swallows the earth in front of it and digests it by means of a special gland. He postulated that all the vegetable mold in the country, that is to say, all the soil enriched with decaying vegetable matter, had probably passed through the worm's intestines several times. He came to the conclusion that it was his vegetable mold that was responsible for the burying of these monoliths. In other words, it was wormworked material that was taking these things down into the ground. 
Darwin's findings were not generally accepted until the 20th century, but lay the groundwork for today's worm scientists. We come to the cemetery to look at the burrows created by Lumbricus terrestris, um, usually in the spring or in the autumn, because those are the best times of year, both in terms of the soil being at its best, but also in terms of earthworm activity. Um, the advantage of working in a cemetery is that they dig holes here all the time, big holes. Kevin and Chris have returned to the cemetery to retrieve the cast they poured earlier. And actually, the, 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 this is good. Take that one. Really? Trying to trace it back to the top. This one's going to last for that just the top. From the cast, they will build a picture of the earthworm community. It's a way of peering into the worm's hidden world. We often get asked questions like, do these earthworms go down two meters? Do they reach the graves, the dead people there? In general, earthworms are detritivores. They just take decaying organic matter, but of the vegetable type. So there's no concern. People shouldn't be worried about earthworms going down and eating their bodies when they're dead. Worm burrows are like bachelor pads. Every worm has its own individual hole which it only leaves in search of extra food or a little sex. It takes a mature earthworm maybe a matter of hours or perhaps days to create a burrow of this type if it's in a new setting. But this is a, a very unusual occurrence. What normally happens is that a burrow, having been used by one animal, if that animal dies um, through natural causes or is predated, then it'll be taken over by another animal. For this reason, burrows can exist for decades, perhaps even centuries. The earthworm's ability to work the soil may hold the solution to a man-made problem. Decades of industrial farming methods have badly damaged the farmland in many areas of the world. Clearing, irrigation, the use of pesticides and fertilizers have destroyed life in the soil and stripped it of its nutrients. The earth becomes powdery, prone to erosion, and incapable of supporting crops. Janola Perez from the University of Rennes in France is just one scientist who believes earthworms can be used to revitalize the soil. Now we just need to shape this soil sample into a cylinder, and then we can move on to the tomograph. Why are we looking more closely at earthworms than at other organisms? Because they represent the majority of the soil's biomass. In a hectare of meadow, you'll find one and a half tons of worms, but they are also strongly affected by environmental factors, and especially by farming techniques. And so we increasingly need to study these organisms to be able to judge the quality of our soil. The number of worms in a soil sample, their size, and the density of their burrows is a measure of how healthy the soil is. Using this ultrasound scanner, Janola can see into the worm's hidden life with astonishing accuracy. Now we're looking at the block of earth we extracted earlier. More precisely, we're looking to see how porous it is. Anything that appears in black is a hole made by an earthworm. Close to the surface, the smallest worms have built a dense network of horizontal burrows, while the larger worms have dug tunnels plunging far deeper. These wormholes play an essential role in fighting erosion, as they allow rainwater to seep further down into the earth. As the water percolates down, it carries with it the organic matter that the worms have worked into the ground, and that is so vital to plant growth. 
We can see that the earthworm changes both the physical and chemical characteristics of the soil. That's why we call the earthworms soil engineers. Janola's work shows that healthy soil is dependent on a thriving worm population and that all hinges on one of the strangest mating rituals in the animal kingdom. If you've tried more than once to quit smoking, you know it's a challenge that's not for sprinters. If only you could manage to stay on that quitting road, discover prescription Chantix. The Chantix approach is twofold, a non-nicotine pill with a program. The pill helps keep nicotine from reaching key receptors in the brain. It can effectively reduce that urge to smoke. And should you slip up, keep trying. Reach out for support. Tell your doctor which medicines you're taking, as they may work differently when you quit smoking. Chantix dosing may be different if you have kidney problems. Side effects may include nausea, trouble sleeping, changes in dreaming, constipation, gas, and vomiting. Studies show 44% were able to quit at the end of 12 weeks. So talk to your doctor about Chantix. It's all about getting there. Wormologist Chris Lowe and Kevin Budd are studying the mating habits of earthworms. I can see one. Here. I think they're mating. Lumbricus terrestris is one of the only earthworms that mates on the soil surface. The two animals come to the surface, keep their tails in their burrows, come together and will stay copulated for two or three hours as they exchange sperm. Earthworms are hermaphrodites. They have both male and female sex organs, both of which are active simultaneously. But the worms still have to mate for fertilization to take place. If for some reason they're disturbed, perhaps a predator comes along, they can rapidly retreat back into the burrows and avoid being eaten. Elsewhere in Europe, other scientists are taking a close look at the sex lives of worms. In the botanical gardens of Tupigen in Germany, Nico Michels and Gregor Schulte are trying to figure out how these hermaphroditic animals handle their dual sexual identity. We have a copulating pair here. The scientists work using red light, which the worms cannot perceive. So while the pair goes about their business, the voyeurs go unnoticed. The reason why we have to go out to uh, observe earthworms at night is that they will only come to the surface when it's dark and humid. During this time, they might be interested in interacting with a neighbor. And then eventually, after a long series of uh, mutual visits or interactions, they might decide to uh, copulate. And this is what we see right here. But why do they mate with another worm when they have both sex organs themselves? Crossbreeding allows for more genetic variety, and scientists think that makes a species hardier and more adaptable to a changing environment. But there are still many unanswered questions, and that prompted Mikels to delve deeper into worm society. By studying hermaphrodites, I'm studying the ultimate equality, sexual equality system. Everybody is the same in a hermaphroditic population. Everybody has the same goals, the same preferences, want to do the same things, want to achieve the same things, has the same options, the same biological structures, everything is identical. In a species with separate sexes, it's fairly easy to tell the boys from the girls. Males often have some kind of adornment, which they use to attract females, and both tend to have distinctive behavior. 
If you generally look at hermaphrodites and you compare them to species with separate sexes, the first thing that you will notice is that the hermaphrodites have very poor eyesight, they don't fly away, they don't sing, they don't have or usually don't have colorful uh, patterns to show, and this is very different from, from insects, mammals, birds, whatever. So apparently, worm mating is hardly the art of seduction. To study this behavior in greater detail, Dr. Mikels and his team have set up artificial burrows in a climate-controlled room under a camera. We've set the air-conditioned room in such a way that the earthworm's day-night rhythm is inverted so that we can watch them mating in the daytime. Not long into the study, the team begins to realize something very weird is happening. From my first experience, it was very obvious that hermaphrodites had very bizarre ways of exchanging sperm and inseminating each other, that it was very obvious to me that something really strange is going on in hermaphrodites. These photos taken with an electron microscope show the skin of a worm after sex. It looks like it's been through a pretty rough night. These nasty love bites came courtesy of its partner, and these weapons, seen in magnification, are double rows of nasty little daggers. Both the worms have these weapons, and each tries to use them on its mating partner to force them into the female role. All individuals in a population of hermaphrodites will prefer to take up the male role, at least initially, and this means that you have a basically not a population of individuals of two sexes, but basically when it comes to mating, it's a population of males, where, where everybody's trying to inseminate everyone else, and nobody's not too much interested in playing the female role all the time. Yet it's females who lay eggs and allow the species to continue. Nico Michels thinks that this power struggle is having a detrimental effect on worm species as a whole. This escalation has slowed down the evolution of hermaphroditic groups much more than in separate sex groups, where there is also sexual conflict, but not to the same extent. Sometimes I have the impression that we tend to believe the illusion that males and females, men and women, are identical, but obviously they are not. And I think my research shows for very good reason, if we all would be the same, if we really would be the same in a sexual sense, then we would, we would without any doubt, end up in the same kind of ridiculous sexual escalations that we see in hermaphrodites. And from my perspective, this is the reason why hermaphrodites have stuck, have been stuck in this uh, worm stage rather than evolving further on. Yet it is precisely because the worm is a hermaphrodite that it was suddenly propelled to the forefront of biological research. It would play a vital role in one of the most revolutionary accomplishments of modern times, the mapping of the genome. So how do 1.25 million feet of lumber turn into an awesome thrill ride? And how do 10,000 panes of glass become the tallest building in the world? To understand how engineers put these monsters together, we are going to take them all apart. Danny Forster braves the world's engineering marvels to show you how the best build it faster, build it taller, and build it bigger. An all-new series, Fridays at 10. Starting in the early 60s, a little round worm called C. elegans would become a high-profile species, thanks to the work of Cambridge University biologist Sidney Brenner. At the time, scientists already knew that genes were responsible for transmitting characteristics from one generation to another. It was also known that they were involved in cell development and that their instructions were relayed through proteins. But most of these discoveries had been made through a study of single-celled organisms, such as bacteria,
Sidney Brenner believed the next step was to look at how genes control the development of more complex organisms. Although we understand now how genes make molecules, we don't know how genes make hands. I mean, many people have said, why aren't we doing brain research like many other people? Uh, why don't we try and work on how the brain works? That, of course, I think is the important challenge of science. But I think we would like first to try and understand how the brain is built. But Brenner needed a laboratory animal to work on. He started with a fruit fly, already familiar to geneticists. But for Brenner, it didn't fit the bill. Its legs, wings, and eyes made it too complex. So he looked for a simpler animal, something whose behavior and anatomy would make it easier to study. He started to consider using small worms. After checking out 60 species of worms, he finally settled on an English roundworm. Though barely four hundredths of an inch long, it had an impressive sounding name, Cedor habditus elegans, soon shortened to C. elegans. These little worms make for great test subjects. Easy to maintain, they eat only bacteria. and can survive perfectly well in petri dishes stowed in the fridge. The strength of the animal is its simplicity. Uh, you know, and the criticism was that it was too simple, but actually the simplicity is also a big advantage because you can then understand at the level of individual cells, moreover at the subcellular level, and individual molecules, and that's something that is rather harder to do in, in other model organisms. Simplicity was not this worm's only appealing quality. C. elegans is capable of fertilizing itself and giving birth to a large number of offspring which reach maturity in just a few days. The mere thousand cells which compose the worm's body are visible through its transparent skin, which makes studying it even easier. Brenner and his team set out to make mutant worms, whose genes could be manipulated to show their impact on the worm's development and functions. Over several years, the worm's genes were methodically broken down into their component parts. Using chemicals and radiation, the scientists accomplished this task, creating whole new generations of oddballs. So the early mutants that were identified were really very, very poorly. They were very sick, they were very uncoordinated. And what that meant is that they were very obvious. You could spot them a mile away that something was wrong with them. The biochemist carried out extensive experiments on the worm's chromosomes. And these manipulations gave birth to all sorts of weird creatures. Dumpy got his name from his abnormally short squat shape. Roller, stuck in a bent position, tended to wriggle round in circles. When geneticist John Sulston joined Brenner's Project C team, he knew nothing about these tiny worms. But they seemed to him perfectly suited to meet Sidney Brenner's goal, to understand how DNA pilots cell development. The central thing is, is mutants that allow you to pinpoint some defect in the animal. Then you can go back in to the genome, find the defective gene, and then you say, ah, this gene now is used in this process, and we can figure out what's going on. Brenner meticulously recorded how each mutant gene affected the worms. After eight years of hard work, he managed to identify 550 of C. elegans 20,000 genes. This was the first step toward mapping a genome. 
At the same time, the worm's anatomy was also being scrutinized. Using a machine with a diamond cutting blade, researchers sliced C. elegans into extraordinarily fine cross-sections, severing a worm just four hundredths of an inch long into 13,000 slices. Each slice was then photographed using an electron microscope. And this meant that one could trace through and discover in three dimensions the, the complete nervous system. And you could see the cuticle, the alia on the outside, you see the pharynx in the, in the middle, the feeding organ. But very particularly is this region labeled nerve ring here. And that's very important because this is the, it's like the brain of the worm. That's where the, the thing thinks, whether to go forwards, backwards, and when to eat and so on. John Sulston would soon focus all his attention on the C. elegans nervous system. For a biologist of the time, there was no finer challenge. When Sulston started on this work, the scientific community believed that worms hatched from their eggs were their nervous systems fully formed. Not so, Solston discovered. I noticed that, that some of these cells were absent when the, when the worm was first hatched. When you look at this diagram, you can see the, the eggs of the worm here, and then they hatch and give these little tiny larvae. Those cells were not there at that stage, but they were there at that stage. So I wanted to know where they'd come from. To solve this mystery, Solston planned to observe the growth of the nerve cells from the very moment the worms hatched. C. elegans' transparent skin was a great advantage. But how do you keep a wriggling worm within the viewing field of a microscope? Everybody thinks, oh, you put the worm under the microscope, it doesn't matter if it dies, you know, just stick it there. And I realized, I, for some reason, I thought, oh, it wants something to eat. It'll, and it was. It immediately slowed down. Now it was just moving, and I could see the cells. Not only was the worm happy, Solston would soon become the first biologist to watch a living being grow cell by cell. If you've tried more than once to quit smoking, you know it's a challenge that's not for sprinters. If only you could manage to stay on that quitting road, discover prescription Chantix. The Chantix approach is twofold, a non-nicotine pill with a program. The pill helps keep nicotine from reaching key receptors in the brain. It can effectively reduce that urge to smoke. And should you slip up, keep trying. Reach out for support. Tell your doctor which medicines you're taking, as they may work differently when you quit smoking. Chantix dosing may be different if you have kidney problems. Side effects may include nausea, trouble sleeping, changes in dreaming, constipation, gas, and vomiting. Studies show 44% were able to quit at the end of 12 weeks. So talk to your doctor about Chantix. It's all about getting there. Studying the C. elegans worm, geneticist John Solston was about to get a major break. And it was a very exciting day for me when I first saw a cell division. For the first time I realized I was going to be able to trace the cell lineage. From that point, Solston was bent over his microscope day and night. Following the growth of each of C. elegans cells from birth to maturity. Once he identified a cell, he didn't let it out of his sight. He took endless notes in a kind of graphic shorthand, recording each cell division minute by minute.
I remember saying to John at the beginning of this, I said, John, it's going to take me a year and a half to do this. Is it worth it? And he said, yeah, of course it is. So I said, all right. <laughs> And here you see the result of that. Eventually, I was able to follow the division of a whole set of precursor cells here through a repetitive pattern, each one divides in more or less the same way to produce a set of daughter cells. For the first time in the history of biology, the cell lineage of a living being had been mapped out in its entirety, providing geneticists with a precious tool for future research. In the course of this task, John Sulston noted an unusual phenomenon. A certain number of cells, 131 to be precise, were born and died without dividing. I just realized that cells were disappearing. And I realized that actually they were disappearing not sort of gradually, but in a very distinctive manner. Sulston suggested it was due to a genetic program that governed the life and death of the cells. And he was right. The same phenomenon occurs during the growth of a human embryo. For example, hands are webbed at first, before the cells of the webbing die, allowing fingers to appear. This programmed cell death is a key part of the development of all living beings. Discovering the role certain genes play in determining whether cells live or die was to lead to far-reaching medical advances. These genes turn out, in a number of cases, to be important in the human body. And we find that the homologous genes in, in our cells uh, can be involved in, in for example, uh, neurodegeneration, where cell death is, in, is, is, is started inappropriately, can be um, involved in cancer, where you don't have cell death when you ought to, so the cancer grows, you know, because it's no longer subject to that control. Since humans and C. elegans share about half the same genes, scientists can experiment on worm genes to study the cell mechanisms involved in human diseases, like cancer, Alzheimer's, or Parkinson's. Thanks to C. elegans, we can also safely test gene therapies designed to repair disturbances to a cell's normal life. What we've learned from this molecular revolution that's been going on since the early 80s is that we can learn most quickly about ourselves a lot of information by studying simpler organisms like C. elegans. In 2002, Sidney Brenner's team was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine for their discoveries on how genes regulate the development of organs and on programmed cell death. And as for the Nobel Prize winning worms, they're still in the lab, carefully preserved in liquid nitrogen at minus 385 degrees Fahrenheit. But they're not dead, they're merely dormant. Not only are C. elegans worms perfect for genome mapping, they can come back to life after lying in the deep freeze for years. So if we wanted to do the experiments all over again, we can, because all the worms are... again. Worms can be very resilient. This ability to alter their metabolism is just one of their survival skills. In fact, worms can survive in the most unlikely places, even inside the human body. Worldwide, over two billion people are infested with parasitic worms. A successful parasite makes sure that the host lives as long as possible and they gain uh, the maximum amount of time to reproduce and to continue to contaminate the environment. Parasitic worms produce extraordinary numbers of offspring, as many as 200,000 eggs a day. They need this huge number of offspring to ensure their survival, as the journey from egg to adulthood is long and hazardous. 
As soon as a larva hatches, the countdown begins. It must find its first host within two days or die. Once that mission's accomplished, it will wait, sometimes for months, for a more permanent host to come along. Then someone will step in water and be infected that way, or a fly will deposit the parasite on someone's skin, or it will find its way into a human by means of a glass of water. A parasite that makes this second stage settles into the human body for a long stay. The next task is to find a way to release its own eggs so that the cycle may continue. Even if you were a science fiction writer, you could not come up with something so, so amazing. <laughs> you know, it's really quite fascinating. It is quite fascinating. After millions of years of evolution, parasitic worms have become extremely efficient. They can remain hidden within a human body up to 20 years. Clearly, most of the problem with these worms is that you live for a long time with them. And therefore, uh, it's the debilitation, the lethargy, that is more of an issue because then you cannot be as productive. Parasitic worms cause serious diseases which devastate entire communities. In some African villages, for example, the majority of adults are struck by blindness caused by larvae of certain threadworms. These tiny parasites can bring whole villages to ruin. Over the past decades, the World Health Organization has been waging war on these worms, which afflict some of the world's poorest countries. Campaigns have been launched to target the larva and the aquatic organisms which enable some worms to spread. Water reservoirs are treated with chemicals to stop the parasites from reaching the human population. Some worm species have been almost entirely eliminated. Unfortunately, others are managing to resist. One of the most sinister of these is the schistosome. Schistosomes use snails as an initial host. No chemical can kill the snail without also killing the local fauna. So the parasites thrive in the first host and spread effortlessly to the second, humans. Here they've developed a lethal advantage. Schistosomes are almost perfect parasites in that they live in the blood system of humans where they should be attacked by the immune system. It was the existence of apparently mimetic proteins, proteins that are produced by the worm, but which are structurally similar to those we know to belong to the insects. The worm has the ability to replicate the cricket's molecules, modify them, then send them back to the cricket. Following these forged instructions, the cricket begins behaving erratically, leaving its natural habitat and heading to the water. But they do not. The schistosome can settle in the human body for long periods because it somehow eludes the immune system surveillance. The schistosomes may be mimicking host functions so that they appear invisible to the immune system. But how does the parasite manipulate its host in order to ensure its own survival? Frederick Tom, before working its way out of the cricket's abdomen, the worms must first propel the insect into the pool, something crickets don't normally do. In fact, if the cricket goes looking for water, it's not its own genes telling it what to do, but actually the genes of the parasite. How can a worm, little more than a simple tube, possibly take control of a more advanced creature like an insect? Using the most sophisticated tools available to a molecular biologist, Tomas discovered that an infected cricket's brain produced twice as many neurons as that of a healthy cricket. And that's not all. 
One of our most surprising discoveries is the cricket's internal organs, which it needs to keep alive until the end. And so it's only at the very end that it will change its host's behavior, forcing it basically to commit suicide by jumping into the water. Thomas has studied these parasite-dictated suicides in swimming pools in the south of France. On some balmy summer evenings, he has recorded as many as two Hamas, an expert on parasites, has studied the biological mechanisms of a nematomorph worm known as Paragordius tricuspidatus. These worms are rarely seen, as they live most of their lives within their insect hosts, usually a cricket. They only emerge when it's time for them to reproduce, which they have to do in water. Tomas decided to use this worm as a model to research how parasites function. Hundred of these death plunges. All species of nematomorph worms need water to reproduce. They're parasites which as adults are necessarily free to move about and more importantly are aquatic. So once they infect a terrestrial insect, they're obviously faced with a problem which is how to get back to the water. Most parasites are small compared to their hosts. Here it's easy to tell that we're dealing with a macro parasite, a very large parasite. Keeping relative proportions, it's like a human having a watering hose around 30 feet long in its stomach. It's a gigantic parasite that has grown from being a microscopic cyst to a very large worm without damage. This ability to send molecular messages is not exclusive to this particular worm. Scientists have detected the same phenomenon in other parasites. Our work on the nematomorphs has made it possible for us to save a considerable amount of time on other areas of research. Research we're carrying out in connection with public health threats such as malaria or sleeping sickness transmitted by the tsetse fly and mosquitoes. Understanding the worm's tactics gives researchers insight into how other parasites manipulate their hosts. The most deadly of them, the malaria parasite, kills a child every 30 seconds in Africa. The parasite is not a worm, but it operates in the same way. It modifies the behavior of its host mosquito, pushing it to bite the victim which suits the parasite best. Once it is installed in the definitive host, a human, it is thought that the parasite causes the person to give off a substance which attracts other mosquitoes. In this way,